Thank you, Kelly. Welcome to Fairhaven. Whether you are here in person or online, it is good to see you. It is good to be with you. Let us enter into a time of reflection as we join together in worship, contemplating on the questions, does our Savior's arrival among us give you the assurance that your life has meaning and worth? And do you feel joy and do you feel joy at the breaking of a new and glorious morn? Loving God, in your constant presence with us, we lift our eyes to you and ask, how does a weary world rejoice? How does a world weary in the realities of war, poverty, violence, division, and despair find a way to rejoice? In your constant presence among us, a connectional people, we turn to you, tired, anxious, doubtful, grieving, and you receive us. In your loving presence among us, a beloved community, we turn to you longing for joy, inspiration, healing, hope, and you receive us. In your unfailing presence with us among friends, strangers, allies, or foes, help us to remember we have stories of hope. And we must tell those stories. Help us to trust that seed planting action of justice will bloom in the spring despite a, hate, a hardened winter ground. We must act. Help us to pray without ceasing for children, youth, and adults who live in fear and the immense grief of overwhelming losses, whose eyes bear witness night and day to unimaginable violence and inhumanities. We must never forget them. Loving God, in your constant presence among your people and all of creation, open our eyes, lest we forget that holy night when a world long laying in sin and error and pining received the gift of our Savior's birth that brought it to its knees to hear the angels' voices. Help us to remember that with our Savior's arrival among us, souls felt their worth, and out of despair, weary souls rejoiced at the breaking of a new and glorious morn. How does a weary world rejoice? With gratitude and assurance that you, as our loving and ever-present God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us join together in our hymn of praise, Joy to the World.
Let us join together in a time of confession. During the season of Advent, we've been asking the question, how does a weary world rejoice? Today, we explore how we can, in part, answer that question by rooting ourselves in ritual. Our faith is decorated with rituals and rhythms that help tie us to God. Confession is one of those rituals. Each week we gather in the space and tell the truth of our lives. And every week God hears our prayers and offers us grace. So let us embrace this holy tradition of confession as we pray together. God of rhythms, we confess our faith would not be what it is without rituals. Unlike you, we depend on bread and water. We have to return to this space again and again to hear old familiar stories. For if we stopped, we would know it would not take long before we lost our way. Forgive us for our fragility and thank you for giving us ordinary rituals and rhythms to hold on to. With grateful and humble hearts, we pray. Amen. Friends, it is not enough to hear once a month or once a year that we are forgiven. We need to hear it every single week. Every single week we need to be reminded that we are held in God's loving embrace. So hear this good news. No matter where you are on your journey of life, love, or faith, no matter what you have left undone, you belong to God. You are claimed, you are known, you are forgiven. This is the good news of the gospel. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our scripture reading for today comes from Luke 2, 21 through 38. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered, in his delay in the wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did not come out, he could not speak. When he did come out, he could not speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision. My apologies. That is Luke 1. I was like, we've done this before. What is this? <laughs> We would have been reading for a while. Okay. Luke 2, 21 through 38. After eight days had passed, it was time to circumcise the child, and he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. When the time had come for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the land, to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. 
The child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign of what will be opposed, so that inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. Then, as a widow to the age of 84, she never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. guys. All right. Get kind of confused where we were in the program. <laughs> um, what's today's? You know what today is? Not the date, but the actual, what's the name? Yes. And that is New Year's Eve. Yes. Correct. Correct. December 30th. Well, the, the December 31st. 31st. December 30th. It's actually an important day for me because it's my wife's birthday. So yesterday, <laughs> so yesterday was Marquia's birthday, and it was a very nice day. I think she enjoyed her special day. Um, but so you said this, um, this is, today is the last day of the what? 2023, and 2023 is what? You see? A year, yes, yes, a year. Yeah. Um, this is kind of a trick question. Um, so do you guys know how many seasons are there in a year? Four, how, yeah, you're right, you're right. Um, how many months are there in a year? 12 months. How many days are there in a year? How many, well, let's, actually, before we get to days, how many weeks? Approximately. It's, it's between 45 and 55. Yeah. 52, 52 weeks, 52 weeks in a year. Yeah, when you guys get paid, you'll, you'll know, oh, yeah, it's 26 <laughs> paychecks. <laughs> 26 paychecks. So 52 weeks. And how many days? That's right. Well, actually, next year we have, next year we have, next year's a leap year. So what does that mean? One month is longer. So February is longer. So. Yeah, so 366 days next year. All right, last question. How many minutes in a year? That's a trick question. You guys, you, I don't expect you guys to know that. I didn't know it either. 2.5 million. Divide that by five. So it's 500, it's 520, sorry, 525,600 minutes. And if you guys have watched, you guys probably haven't seen it, but um, there's a play called Rent. It's a very popular play. There's a, it was on Broadway, and there's a film about it. But one of the songs in there is called, it's titled Seasons of Love, and it goes 500, 525,600 minutes in a year. That's how many minutes there are in a year. And the reason behind that song, I'm going to kind of go through the lyrics a little bit, is um, we have so many minutes of the year that, you know, we should all appreciate each and every single one. You know, we have happy times. We have sad times. You guys remember times you laughed this year? You guys remember times you cried this year? Hopefully more laughter than crying, right? More more when you're younger? Oh, wow, if you remember even further back, that's, that's great. Yeah, we should always remember all the years of our lives, you know, and the song goes, you know, how do you, how do you measure a year? 
um, which is why they bring out the minutes. You can measure it in minutes, but you can also measure it in love. Um, that was the entire point of a song. The theme of a song was love. You can measure all the moments of love that you had in the year. Love for your siblings, love for your family, um, love for your friends. Um, but also all those little moments you know, of happiness, sadness, of learning, of new experiences. Um, I know this year was a big year for me. You know, um, we got a new, new place, and um, I moved on for a job I had for seven years. You know, I thought it was time to move on. You know, new growth. You guys are going to. You, you went to medical school? Wait, wait. Middle school. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. You guys are going to another year after, well, you're partway through your current school year, um, and then you go to another year. So it's another, just remember to cherish it. But also, remember. As, as we go from tom today to tomorrow, tomorrow is a new year. So new year means we move past everything that happened this year. Everything that happened this year is in the past. We, learn, we, keep, we keep our experiences in our mind, but we don't let that hold us back, you know, and we look forward to positive growth, po positive, more positive experiences next year, right? More, well, you're absolutely correct. Yeah, we should think that every day as well. Like, you know, this year, this today was a sad day, Today and I didn't get everything out planned done, but you look you look forward to the next day. That's a great a great point. Um, so anyway, the Bible verse I have for you today kind of reflects that. So it's Isaiah chapter forty three verses, yeah, two verses eighteen and nineteen. Um, so it goes: Forget the former things; do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness, and streams in the wasteland. So I'll read the, let's focus on that first part, um, verse 18, in this first half of verse 19. So I'll read that again. Um, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past, right? Forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. Of course, you cherish the experiences that you had, you, you learn and you grow. Um, but see, I am doing a new thing. We should all be excited for the new year, what's going to happen? And now it springs up, do you not perceive it, right? Um, so what, what, what did we learn here? We learned how many minutes there were in a year, and we learned to... Um, do you guys remember how many minutes, by the way? It's okay. No test. No test. 500,000. Oh, you have it? Oh, wow. Great. I wish I had a price to give you. Um, oh, wow. I haven't gotten to the second. That's, my brain doesn't expand. I, don't, I need more memory in my brain for that. <laughs> All right. Let's have, a, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this month. Thank you for this year. Thank you for our four beautiful seasons. And thank you for those 525,600 minutes that we experienced this year, um, or we will experience when the clock gets midnight. Um, thank you for all the times of joy, even the times of sadness, times of new experiences, times of even repeating old experiences, um, meeting new friends, meeting new colleagues, um, please help us to look forward, to appreciate all those experiences, and then move forward and learn from those experiences as we move forward into the new year. And please bring lots of prosperity and growth, and watch over all of us here. And those who are here to join us today, please keep us all safe this upcoming year and healthy, and um, bless us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Good morning, Fairhaven. Good morning, Fairhaven. Uh, I need to check, can people hear me? Yes, okay. Um, the reason why I'm preaching today is because uh, it's the fifth Sunday and usually we have a lay person on the fifth Sunday of the month. And secondly, uh, Reverend Ken is away, so we needed a substitute preacher. And the reason why I'm at home and not at church is that last night I developed a, a respiratory infection. I don't think it's COVID, but I figured I should not come to church in case I am infectious. So will you join me in a word of prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So throughout this Advent and Christmas season, uh, we've been asking a question. How does a weary world rejoice? And we've considered several answers, beginning with acknowledging our weariness, then finding joy in connection, allowing ourselves to be amazed, singing stories of hope, and on Christmas Eve, make room for Jesus. And today we continue to examine that question, how does a weary world rejoice? By focusing on the rituals in which we engage that help to give our lives meaning, meaning and joy. In this sermon, I shall talk about four rituals and show how each of them is accompanied by joy. These rituals are the two that we read about in our scripture from Luke, Jesus' circumcision and Mary's purification. And the two rituals that the Methodist Church regards as sacraments, namely baptism and Holy Communion. But first, let's, uh, let's define what we mean by ritual as opposed to routine. The words are often used interchangeably, but they're not the same. I found uh, what seems to me to be an accurate and concise definition and distinction between the two on something called the contentauthority.com. Uh, a ritual is a set of actions or behaviors that are imbued with symbolic meaning and significance. It often involves repetition as it is performed with intention and purpose. On the other hand, a routine is a set of actions or behaviors that are performed regularly and habitually often without much thought or intention. So using those definitions, uh, going to communion would be attending a ritual. Making coffee first thing in the morning is a routine. Getting up early each day to go for a run would normally be a routine, although it could amount to a ritual if you habitually meditate or pray while you are running. The scripture that Ali read refers to two of the rituals that Mary and Joseph engaged in following the birth of Jesus. The first was circumcision followed by the naming ceremony. Circumcision is the oldest recorded Jewish ritual. It was the first commandment that God gave to Abraham, as is recorded in Genesis chapter 17. God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskins and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Throughout your generations, every male among you shall be circumcised when he is eight days old, including the slave born in your house and the one bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring. 
any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people, for he has broken my covenant. So we see that for the Jewish people, circumcision is a ritual ordained by God. And for them, it is a weighty obligation. But more pertinent to the subject of this sermon, the circumcision is followed by a celebratory meal. And that is an occasion for rejoicing. Rejoicing because of a new life that has come into the world. Rejoicing because that new life has now been named. And the second ritual that Luke describes as that of purification. Now that is not the purification of Jesus, but the purification of Mary. And Moses prescribed this particular ritual in Leviticus. The Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, a woman who becomes pregnant and gives birth to a son will be ceremonially unclean for seven days just as she is unclean during her monthly period. On the eighth day, the boy is to be circumcised. Then the woman must wait 33 days to be purified from her bleeding. She must not touch anything sacred or go to the sanctuary until the days of her purification are over. If she gives birth to a daughter, for two weeks the woman will be unclean, as during her period. Then she must wait 66 days to be purified from her bleeding. When the days of her purification for a son or daughter are over, she is to bring to the priest at the entrance to the tent of meeting a year old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a dove for a sin offering. He shall offer them before the Lord to make atonement for her. And then she will be ceremonially clean from her flow of blood. These are the regulations for a woman who gives birth to a boy or a girl. That if she cannot afford a lamb, she is to bring two doves or two young pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for her and she will be clean. I've no doubt that this passage uh, makes many of you feel uncomfortable. It contains ideas about the status of women and girls that to say the least seem outdated and even misogynistic. And as I was searching the web for material for the sermon, I found lengthy dissertations on this purification ritual. Uh, what it meant in the days when it was first instituted and what it meant in first century Judea and how some have reinterpreted it to make it more palatable to the way we think about and understand women in the 21st century. Now that is a fascinating topic, but it's a diversion from this sermon, namely that rituals can bring rejoicing. And that was certainly the case when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple. We read that upon seeing Jesus, Simeon spontaneously uttered the joyful words of what we now know as the Nunc Diminis, or the Song of Simeon. Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. You can hear his joy springing out from his words. And we also read that a prophetess named Anna, when she saw Jesus, began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Presumably, she did so with great joy. Mary's purification is celebrated each year at the Feast of Candlemas. This is the occasion of the Feast of the Presentation or Purification. It's one of the oldest feasts or rituals of the Catholic Church. And a pilgrim named Egeria left a record of how it was celebrated in Jerusalem around the year 380 AD. And this is what she said. 
but certainly the Feast of the Purification is celebrated here with the greatest honor. On this day, there is a procession to the Anastasis. And as an aside, in this context, the Anastasis means the Church of the Holy Sepulchre or the Church of the Resurrection. So they all go in procession to the Anastasis and all things are done in order and with great joy just as Easter. All the priests preach, and also the bishop, always treating of that passage of the gospel where on the 40th day Joseph and Mary brought the Lord into the temple. So there we see uh, two ancient rituals that bring forth joy. And moving forward to the present day, we all participate to a greater or lesser extent in many, many rituals. Uh, saying grace before a meal is one example. To some of us, coming to the late Christmas Eve service here at Fairhaven is a ritual full of joy and meaning. I could list many rituals, great and small, but I will focus on the two that are regarded as sacraments in the United Methodist Church, baptism and Holy Communion. Now, the United Methodist Hymnal tells us that the baptismal covenant is God's word to us, proclaiming our adoption by grace and a word to God promising our response of faith and love. Most baptisms in our church are of infants, when parents or sponsors make promises to nurture the child in Christ's holy church until they're able to accept God's grace for themselves. And this they would do at a service of confirmation, often in the early teens. In addition, uh, someone who has not been previously baptized can be baptized as an adult. Uh, and in either case, there is joy as we welcome a person into the fellowship of our congregation and the life of the church. As a baptismal covenant, in our hymnal states, when all the candidates have been baptized, the pastor says, now it is our joy to welcome our new sisters and brothers in Christ. To which the congregation responds, through baptism, you are incorporated by the Holy Spirit into God's new creation and made a share in Christ's royal priesthood. We are all one in Christ Jesus with joy and thanksgiving we welcome you as members of the family of Christ. Our other sacrament, uh, communion or the Eucharist, is something that we do regularly for several reasons. And there's not time to go into all of them here. But the simplest one is that Jesus told us to do it, as is recorded in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, take eat, this is my body. And then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Thus, during the communion, we remember the great sacrifice that Jesus made for us, when his body was broken on the cross and his blood was spilled and he brought into effect the new covenant. Uh, the prophet Jeremiah spoke about this covenant in chapter 31. Uh, the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, so I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. 
for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. And this connects directly to what John Wesley considered to be the greatest reason for attending communion. It is a means of grace, a means of connecting with God so that we know indeed that he forgives our iniquity and remembers our sin no more. Wesley regarded communion as probably the paramount or foremost means of grace. Defined by the Merriam-Webster dictionary as unmerited divine assistance given to humans for their regeneration or sanctification. The classic definition of grace from the Christian church is simply God's unmerited favor. And the sharing of the bread and the wine, and these are metaphors for the body and blood of our savior. They convey forgiveness of sins and reconciliation and healing that is tangible and real. John Wesley put it this way, the grace of God given herein, and that is during the communion service, confirms to us the pardon of our sins by enabling us to leave them behind. As our bodies are strengthened by bread and wine, so are our souls by these tokens of the body and blood of Christ. This is the food of our souls. This gives strength to perform our duty and leads us on to perfection. If therefore we have any regard for the plain command of Christ, if we desire the pardon for our sins, if we wish for strength to believe, to love and to obey God, then we should neglect no opportunity of receiving the Lord's Supper. To repeat, to John Wesley, Holy Communion is a means by which we receive the grace of God. And incidentally, this is why the United Methodist Church has an open table. We invite all who wish to come to do so. Not all denominations practice this open table. For example, except in cases of emergency, the Catholic Church administers communion only to those who have been baptized into the Catholic Church and who are already in a state of grace. And one means of ensuring that you're in a state of grace is that you have participated in the Catholic sacrament of confession and reconciliation something that we in the Methodist Church do not regard as a sacrament and quite frankly, rarely if ever do, certainly before communion. So the key distinction here is that Catholics generally require you to be in the state of grace before attending communion, whereas Methodists, as taught by John Wesley, believe that communion is a means of receiving grace. Thus, if we were to prevent people who need grace from attending communion, we are actually closing off one of the most effective, indeed, probably in Wesley's opinion, actually the most effective means of receiving God's grace. And to me, this is uh, one of the significant reasons why I remain a Methodist. So that's probably enough about the importance of communion. And as already stated, the purpose of this sermon is to show how joy and ritual are connected. And in the case of communion, let's do this by looking at the word Eucharist, which in the original Greek means thanksgiving. But notice that within the word Eucharist, which in the in, in the, within the word Eucharist is the word charis, C-H-A-R-A-S. And this is the Greek word for grace. The Greek word for rejoice is very similar. Charo, C-H-A-I-R-O. And the Greek word for joy is chara, C-H-A-R-A. So they all sound very similar. And Greek scholars have a technical term for this. They tell us that the, these three words are cognate. And this means derived from the same root and having the same core of fundamental meaning. 
Therefore, we should expect that whenever we receive a revelation of grace as in communion, joy is an inevitable consequence. And this was a view shared by Charles Wesley in one of the poems in his 1745 collection of hymns on the Lord's Supper. This is what he says. Jesu, we thus obey thy last and kindest word. Here in thine own appointed way, we come to meet our Lord. The way thou hast enjoined, thou wilt therein appear. We come with confidence to find thy special presence here. Our hearts we open wide to make to save the room. And lo, the lamb, the crucified, the sinner's friend is come. His presence makes the feast. And now our bosoms feel the glory not to be expressed, the joy unspeakable. Amen. All right, let us join together in prayer. God of yesterday, tomorrow, and today, <coughs> eight days after Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph took him to the temple, the heart of their community, your sanctuary. Just as Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple, we bring our prayers into this sanctuary. We bring our exhausted prayers, our bleary-eyed laments, our prayers of deep joy, and our prayers overflowing with gratitude. And we give them all to you. We thank you, God, for the joys of the season. Thank you for turning ordinary moments into holy reminders of your gospel promise. We are surrounded by so many gifts and we do not want to miss an opportunity to express our gratitude. We are especially thankful for all of those who are celebrating another birthday, another year of walking in your grace and light. We thank you for Tompkins, Freddie, Vernon, and Ramon. Thank you for their presence in our lives. However, Despite the abundant gifts of the season, we acknowledge the heartache that is also in the season. And we bring those prayers as well. So holy God, for individuals who long to be parents like Mary and Joseph, but find themselves facing infertility or loss, be with them. For individuals spending the season in hospital rooms or waiting for answers, especially for Cynthia, Jennifer, and Joelle. Surround them with your assurance and healing. For family and friends in grieving, especially for Yvonne, send your comfort and walk with them. For those who feel like they are going through the motions and who are searching, for those who are seeking jobs or are simply seeking you, be with them. For those who see the joy of the season but cannot ignore the weariness in their hearts, be with them. God, we hand these prayers spoken and silent over to you. You meet us once again in the ordinary rituals of our faith. Rituals like prayer, singing, studying, dancing, scripture, and gathering with community. You meet us at the table and the fonts. Holy God, you meet us where we are at, and you find us over and over and over again. As you continue to meet us where we are, we promise that like Mary and Joseph, we will do our best to bring our weary and hopeful spirits back to your temple, back to you. Amen.
We have worshiped together today through our singing, through our prayers, for the sharing of the word. And now we come together through our giving, giving back to the Lord who has given to us through our offerings. of abundant grace and mercy, we thank you for these gifts. And we give back a portion to you. May you bless this offering. May it be good and pleasing in your sight. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. You may be seated.
friends, let us prepare to enter the new year with hearts that have been unburdened. For we have made our confession before God and one another. How do we rejoice in a weary world? By coming to the table of grace, where all, and all means all, are welcome. Let us pray together. God of stars and angels, God of sheep and lambs, God of abundance and grace, you know us well, better than we know ourselves. You hear us cry, Gloria, and praise, and you watch us tear things apart with our words and deeds. You hear us say, Thy will be done, and use me, O God, and you watch us do nothing in response to cries for help. You know us, and you love us, and you forgive. Hear us now. Help us change, turn us around. Make us more loving and courageous and hopeful. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may remain seated. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy God, with a heart bursting with love and with arms wide open, you created the universe. You spun stars into space, hung moons in nighttime skies, and filled the earth with wonder and beauty. Holy God, with a heart aching with love for your creation, you sent us Jesus. He was heralded by Mary's song of compassion, born in a stable, welcomed by doves and donkeys, poor shepherds and foreign travelers. He ate with sinners, healed the sick, befriended the lost and oppressed, confounded the scholars and teachers. He lived in obedience to your word and revealed the depths of your love. Therefore, with all the joy of children, on Christmas in the heavenly chorus of angels, we praise you and join their joyous song saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy God, we praise you for this holy season when you sent your best gift to us. We thank you that Jesus raised up those of low degree, fed the hungry, healed the sick, and drew us back to you to walk the path of light. From manger to the cross, he turned the world around. We remember that he took bread, the staff of life, and gave thanks to you, broke it and gave it to his community. Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. And he took the cup, the fruit of the earth, the blessing of the sun, gave thanks to you, gave it to his community and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed 
by his love and by your spirit make us one with Christ one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your son Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now let us join together in the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples. Our Father, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of a one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. In the United Methodist Church, we serve an open communion. That means that all who have a relationship of love with Jesus Christ are invited to come, and all means all. You don't have to be baptized. You don't have to be a member of Fair Haven. You just need to be willing to come to the table of grace. I invite our communion stewards to come forward. I know that this is a special time of the year as we're ending and as we're beginning. But I would like to extend an invitation to those persons who are celebrating birthdays in the month of January to come forward first to receive. And I know that we have one person who is celebrating a hundred and we invite you to come forward. And I share with you that I will have the gluten-free elements.
Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Strengthen our hearts that we might believe of the going into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. It seems that an appropriate way to start the new year, even though it has not arrived yet, it's coming, is to say together Wesley's covenant prayer. Is that next? Yes. So let us join together. Why don't we stand and say this prayer together? I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what you rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee exalted for thee, or brought low for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine, and I am thine, so be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. And now let us join together in song. Remember that 